Pittsburgh pulls up for three. Boom! Knocks it down. Curry from the corner at three. Puts it in. For overtime, makes it go. Welcome from me, Mark Woods, to the MVP cast. We're brought to you in association with Total Environmental Compliance. You can check them out at tecompliance.co.uk. Now, my guest in this edition is the former director of Glasgow Rocks and also a former director of the British Basketball League. He comes from an investment background with all sorts of business sectors that he has been involved in, but with a sideline in sport dating back to the days when he was a key advisor in the takeover of Celtic Football Club by Fergus McCann. David Lowe, welcome to the MVP cast. Welcome, Mark. Here. Mark, thank you for having me. Um, you're no longer a director of the, of the Rocks, but still I'm very passionate about the club, still a shareholder. Your your sense of the temperature, though, of, of both Glasgow and the situation in which we find it ourselves now for for the sport as a whole well i think the situation for basketball is very similar to the situation that you find with all attendance based sports uh, in the midst of a pandemic and that is it's a very difficult situation a very difficult situation indeed so if you have an interest in basketball you're going to be having a, a rough time in the same way as you have, a, if you have an int- interest in soccer or rugby or any other sport, you'll be having a, a very rough time. Uh, more so because we don't know with any degree of clarity, you know, when the virus will end. Personally, you know, I'm saying we're going to have trouble uh, having a, a viable uh, leagues uh, until we have a vaccine, and we don't know when that's going to be. It could be a year, could be two years, but that's. That's the time horizon uh, that I'm looking at uh, with the various interests I have. And give people a sense of, of what happened when effectively the shutdown came. What actions were you guys taking as a club to you know, immediately preserve the, the well-being of the Rocks? Well, I, I was in the, the US uh, at the end of February, uh, beginning of March, and uh, I had very I had difficulty getting home because of the virus and that was the exact moment that I thought you know what this is bloody serious <laughs> you know this virus is going to have an awful lot of ramifications so I, I, I when I get back I, I told and I was still on the, the board I think of uh, Glasgow Rocks at the time I, I, I said to the guys I, I think this is serious I think uh, there's a increasing likelihood that uh, a lot of the spectator based sports are, go- are going to get shut down and uh, that was the moment uh, certainly I thought that uh, we better start uh, looking at uh, what, what we should be doing here how we should be managing it and uh, and of course since then it's get progressively worse and perhaps may we all get worse again but that, that was my a moment in time uh, the end of February I, I, I realised this was really serious I mean, that's from a club point of view. Where do you see the challenges going forward, from particularly from a business perspective for the league? Because we've, we've the Sunday should have been the playoff final in London, a big revenue spinner for for the BBL. That's not taking place. We see clubs of certain financial constraints with they own arenas, they have interest payments on that to make. Other clubs have different commitments. What what will be the biggest challenges from a league perspective over the next? Six, twelve, maybe even eighteen months. Well, I, I think if, if you're talking about the BBL, I, I, I think it's a crisis. I, I think there's a grave danger that the the BBL will suffer an insolvency event, and I don't think that's a, a, a far out thing to say because basically, if you look at all sports leagues across the globe, all uh, teams and clubs in th- those leagues. Basically, we are all operating on a nil revenue environment, nil revenue, i.e. no money coming in for an indeterminate period of time. So therefore, if your your household is in that situation, you've got a problem, you know, if you have no income coming into your house. So if you're operating a league and that league has no income coming into it, it doesn't take a rocket science scientist to work out you're going to have a problem. 
And this is the situation that the BBL finds itself in, similar to the the Scottish Football Association or the English FA, uh, a nil revenue environment for its members. But the league, I think, has got an acute uh, problem because most of its revenue is end of season loaded. Uh, i.e. you've got your cups and you've got your playoffs and uh, these are profit centres for, for the BBL and they're they're not going to take place uh, this year, uh, I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I might be wrong but I, I, I suspect you know that these events will not take place at all. So I think that presents a, a serious problem for the, the BBL. The other problem, it's a, it's a societal or an economic problem, if you have cash or if you have access to cash in a situation such as this, uh, your prospects of surviving it are better than if you don't have any cash or if you're carrying debt. And unfortunately, the BPL, B, the BBL sorry, is carrying debt. You know, It owes 350 grand or so to uh, six clubs and it doesn't have any cash in the bank. So when you... you put all these things together you know I'd, 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 re- I'd be really worried about uh, the BBL uh, sport uh, there's a lot of grants kicking about but I, I don't know to what extent the BBL can can, can uh, make use of these but if there are grants available certainly they should be taking those grants up debt, taking on debt you know you shouldn't really take on any debt unless you have a, a means of uh, repaying that debt. I don't think it would be right to do that. So, all said, you know, I think it's going to be a very difficult environment for the BBL. Uh, and, of course, de facto, you know, that's a worrying time for the clubs in the BBL because we need a league. Without a league, we don't literally have a league to play in. And then each club will have its own issues to deal with as well. But I don't think any of this is good. I don't think there's any silver lining anywhere. And I think we all have to be, all stakeholders in uh, basketball in, in the UK have to be worried, as are stakeholders in soccer and rugby uh, and other sports as well. I mean, there was a quote, I know it wasn't named, suggesting the situation of the BBL this week was quote unquote terminal. And it, when you, you put it in those very stark terms, I mean, is there. Is there anything, given the, the the status of the league, and it's made up really of its clubs in, in, in its most of its senses? But is there anything now that can be done to mitigate the risk at this point in time? Well, I, I don't. I wouldn't say it's terminal because there is always something you can do. It can attract new investment, for example, a new management and new investment. You know, uh, to uh, uh, put it back in funds and to sort of kickstart. Uh, uh, an era after the virus ends but unfortunately another thing that happens in in a period of great uncertainty or in in a recession is that economic activity ceases and uh, or certainly slows down Uh, corporate activity and deals just about dry up and everybody tends to uh, hoard cash and adopt a bunker attitude and a, uh, a very conservative attitude and that's what we have just now, uh, a very uh, negative attitude per- pervading the whole economy of which sport you know, itself is, is, is caught up in. That doesn't last forever. Uh, attitudes do change, recoveries do take place. But what we find ourselves in just now with the, the, the COVID virus is is a well certainly a human tragedy and we know that but it's also a financial catastrophe and i I don't think uh, we're anywhere near the recovery phase yet i still think uh, that this negative attitude is going to prevail for some considerable amount of time and i think spectator based sports are going to be amongst the last areas to uh, see any relaxation in the lockdown rules, etc. I, I don't really see, see big crowds congregating anywhere, be it gigs, cinemas, gyms, uh, soccer games, or, or basketball. So I, I think we're in a sector that's going to be last to come out of this, and it's going to be very difficult for all stakeholders in this space. 
because it's not going to be and this is from people I've, I've spoken to it's not going to just be about the regulations and the restrictions on spectators it will be a cultural psychological hurdle that sport and theatre and cinema etc have to overcome to persuade people to sit indoors in groups and watch yes something. Well, this is true. I mean, there's, there's several different different attitudes you can have. You can have a, a devil may care attitude. You tend to have a devil may care attitude. The younger you are, younger people are less concerned about the, the, the type of uh, this type of environment. Uh, so you know, they all have raves and go to gigs and go to cinemas and I mean, go to sports events before. Uh, generally speaking, older people because that's that's part of the nature of being young. But they're also don't tend to be the, the big spenders uh, in basketball certainly in Glasgow anyway and I think it's similar elsewhere it's very much a family sport you know the family of four coming along to see basketball now I don't think uh, when you dissect that section uh, I, I don't think uh, they're all going to suddenly return to live, live sport uh, en masse they're not going. To, a lot of, of people that watch basketball, football, etc. They're not going to hibernate, lock down for three months, and suddenly put it all at risk by going, you know, to the cinema or a restaurant or a sports event. Uh, they're going to continue to be very cautious and conservative. And of course, they've broken a habit, and they might have found other interesting things to do. So that, that that's a, a negative aspect to be overcome. There's also another segment that have suffered very badly financially and simply might not have the money uh, to go out to uh, sports events basketball in this instance so these are the negative aspects that ha have to be overcome and that will take time and you only have uh, access to time if you have access to money because if you have money you can you can write these things out so if you have money, your chances of uh, survival coming out the other end stronger are, are better. Uh, so good luck to everybody on, on, on the, the journey through this crisis. I mean, a lot of this is, is about investment, whether it's club level, league level, etc. I mean, let's go back a little bit to first principles. As someone who's come from that background, what persuaded you to invest and buy into the rocks when you bought a, initially a share off from Ian Reid who had owned the rocks for a very long time yeah it seems like a lifetime ago but it was only wow six years ago maybe slightly more I can't, I can't remember but I am a sports nut I have always played sport I've always watched sport uh, my children are the same I go to rugby I go to football and I also go to basketball I met Ian Reid by accident and he, at a basketball game, funnily enough, my friend uh, Raymond Sparks was the GM of the, let me get this right, I think it was called Team Solripe <laughs> way back the in Falkirk the... Falkirk team. <laughs> yeah, team. yeah. well, he's he was uh, the GM or whatever you call it uh, back in the day when basketball was rocking and rolling and I went to basketball with him. I went to see the Glasgow Rocks and uh, the Kelvin Hall in the West End and I met Ian and he started telling me about uh, what the rocks did in the community uh, in deprived areas uh, uh, going in teaching good habits to kids uh, don't smoke, don't drink, do your homework you know then uh, an exotic basketball player from America would do a little bit of Harlem Globetrotters hand out some tickets and go on his way so that, that really struck a chord with me the other thing that struck a chord with me is that it was much more family oriented and much less aggressive than a, like a soccer game. Nobody was shouting and swearing. <laughs> that took me a while to get used to. <laughs> but I just liked it, you know. So I liked sport. I liked uh, Ian Reid. Still do. Uh, I'm a Glaswegian. I live in the West End. That's down the road. Couldn't help myself. And then an opportunity to invest was presented to me. Ian had a couple of. Uh, dormant uh, passive uh, shareholders who wanted out so I bought them out. I've never been involved in the running with, of the rocks then they, certainly not then and certainly not now I'm talking about the operational day to day stuff but uh, I, I love the sport uh, definitely and I love going to the to, to the games and will continue to go to the games uh, even though I'm no longer a, a director and Duncan's a good guy, a good friend 
He's got exceedingly good taste in football clubs. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> the one across uh, the road from the Emirates have been nurtured. Anyway, yes, any, been any doubt. In fact, he once told me the only reason why you bought the rocks is so you can get a parking space for Celtic. <laughs> Quite convenient, as anyone doesn't know, it's right across the road. I think there'll be some people down in, down, down in the, or, uh, the other teams that probably think that's true. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> when, you, when you look at it, though, I mean, inevitably, you can judge these things with your heart and what you believe is, is good work and everything there, but from, from you're always going to have that prism of investment. How do you, did you view the rocks then from an investment point of view? And I guess, how would you view British basketball as an investment proposition? Well, that's an interesting question, yes, because I am a, a, an investor, a, a private equity guy, and I can't help it. I cannot help, uh, you know, seeing everything that I'm involved in through the prism of, a, of, it, of it being an investment. So I, I, I own up to that. But at the end of the day, it's a relatively modest investment. The investment wasn't genuinely wasn't made on investment grounds. It, you know, I wasn't expecting of turning X into Y, uh, and uh, and suddenly you know being making a lot of money. The, the investment's not large enough to, to to have that significance for me. But it is an investment. That's it's true to say that. What what I found was that. Uh, it was a real hodgepodge of clubs in the league. There were some that had been a. There's a core that have been around forever and a day, and then and, and we know who they are in no particular order. It's what is it? It's going south, it's Newcastle, uh, Leicester, Sheffield, London. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would include Plymouth in that. They're they're relatively newer newer, but the the, the rest are are just are, are not in the same category. They're, they're sort of newcomers of a fashion, don't have the same level of uh, of depth uh, involvement uh, as the clubs I've just mentioned previously. But over time, and I've also found, and one of the first things I came across was an attempted takeover by, I can't remember his name, who was it? Uh, a guy, Hugh Morgan, that's who it was. Uh, and then I get accidentally invo involved in that. I mean, that was ridiculous. They, they, I found out that the BBL only had a one-year rolling license to play basketball. So Glasgow was in a, a league with a one-year rolling license to play basketball. And if that license didn't exist, you know, we, we would basically have a team without a league to play in. So I found that a bit alarming. And then Hugh Morgan, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be very delicate what I'm saying here, was, I think I'm correct in saying, Chief Executive of Basketball England, and he got himself involved in a consortium that wanted to uh, take the license off the BBL and award it to a group that he was involved in. So I got involved in, uh, in uh, trying to prevent that with Kevin Rowledge, who was the other individual involved, in the shareholder in uh, Leicester, and uh, we succeeded in doing that. But that, that's not something I envisaged, uh, an attempted takeover of the league of which the team had just invested in but it sort of trolled me even more into the sort of politics uh, and the investment corporate aspect of basketball completely unexpectedly and you know we ended up eventually with with a license the bbl that is but that was the first thing that happened then several other people have been on the scene but i've also discovered that there's so much unfulfilled potential in British basketball. Uh, but in order to fulfill that, it, it, it really does need investment. Uh, the, the league operates in a shoestring. Uh, Andy Webb, the chief operating officer, he, he does the best he can with a very sort of limited budget. But I, I, I came to the conclusion, that, uh, as did my other directors at the time, that British basketball couldn't really fulfill its potential uh, if it did not have a fairly significant uh, investment of new capital and uh, a management buy-in, and uh, so that that's what I discovered, you know, three or four years ago, and it's it's basically the BBL has been running on empty ever since. Where does that capital come from? You know, someone again who has found these wells of cash in the past. Where does that capital come from, and what is the proposition that could be put there to attract someone? 
or internally, yeah. externally, wherever it might come from, to put up a budget, a bigger budget, a bigger investment, the, the, the sort of funds that could be transformative? Yeah, well, any investor in anything is only investing because he expects to make a return or a profit on that investment. So it's not done for any altruistic reasons, really. Uh, it's really serious investment, which is basically transformational investment, investment that's going to uh, completely change, improve, upscale a, a business. That, that That's a lot of money, and that money uh, that's invested requires a return. So for the BBL to attract an, an investor, a third-party investor, that is, doesn't have a beneficial interest in a club, that investor is looking for a return. And I always saw that third-party investor that's looking for a return as being in competition for the club-owning investors. Because what I mean by that is if the league makes profits, the profits have to be shared between the, the club investors and the external investor. So that that's, that's a, a difficult uh, concept to uh, embrace or to easily embrace is it's technically possible but it, but it is difficult to, to achieve so the point I'm making though is that an external investor requires a return uh, so if the BBL was to fulfill its potential and what does that mean you have to define that fulfilling its potential basically means bigger crowds uh, bigger attendances more sponsorship uh of everything, uh, the league and the competitions that the league runs, basically the financial numbers go way up, and by so doing, it allows the the, the standard to rise because those revenues would would uh, mean that uh, the league and the teams in the league would be capable of attracting better caliber players. The, the whole standard would rise, and you would create this uh, virtuous circle of improvement. But the, the problem that, uh, well, the first thing that uh, most outsiders say when they look at British basketball is, why is it so small? Why is it the, the anomaly in Europe? Surely it has the potential to to achieve the status that basketball has in many uh, continental countries. And it's a good question to ask, you know, why, why isn't it the case? Is it because it's, not, it's been poorly run? Is it because uh, it's not had any investment? I suspect it's to do with both, uh, or is it cultural? If it's just cultural and people, and uh, you say that the UK is really just a, a rugby, soccer, and, and cricket country, and everything else is going to be minority sport. If you believe that, you know that basketball there therefore would not be a an attractive investment. So I'm of the view that with the correct management. Uh, and the correct investment that UK pro basketball is capable of aspiring to the mean in continental Europe. But certainly thus far, it hasn't happened. And it's not going to happen anytime soon during a virus, but it is an opportunity. Sorry, I interrupted you. You, you, oh, no, you were on the board, obviously, of the BBL for quite some time. And... You know, there's always been a recognition of external investment and there's always been, you referred to Hugh Morgan's plan which rapidly fell apart, there's, there's been other people have sniffed around this this league of, over the years, It's not nothing's really come to it but you've seen in the likes of CVC buying into rugby through the, you know, the Pro, Pro 14 and, and Six Nations etc, so there are, there are groups out there who, who see opportunity in sport how much of a willingness have you ever have you ever sensed from within the league and the other owners, etc., to giving up something to maybe get more. Well, that's quite an interesting question. <laughs> well, let's be clear. Uh, uh, I resigned from the BBL board in January 2019 before I before you know I was removed from the board because, and that's not I'm not embellishing that in any way because because it's true. Uh, and the reason why is because I was in a gang of one. Uh, you know, I had lots of ideas. Uh, I was very critical. Uh, I was very political. And I, I am by nature quite a forthright uh, 
blunt speaking Scotsman and, and you know a lot of things I had to say he did not uh, go down uh, very well with uh, the other directors I think what the, the, they really wanted was a, a bunch of uh, nodding dog directors which I think they've got, I, I don't really have too much time for the, the BBL board because I, I don't think they're very good so I, I, I was asked to leave in the, but that's, what's that now? that's over a year ago, a year and a quarter ago I also think a phrase I used, uh, you know, when I left was that uh, in the land of the blind, you know, the one-eyed man is king, and that's because I think there is a. I've seen it before in other businesses and other sports. I think there there, there are some people that like being in charge of something small, rather than uh, surrendering control for something big. So, I think anybody that wants to. Uh, Change the dynamic, change the management, change the the uh, the uh, structure is 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 going to face uh, some opposition. But the situation has changed. I mean, it's out with uh, the, the board's hands now. The the COVID virus has basically uh, changed the whole landscape, and survival is now the name of the game. I think there will be people interested in, in basketball, but not quite yet because the situation's not reached the bottom yet. You know, Alton Berg was on the MVP cast a, a few weeks ago, and you know, he made, uh, as an interested observer from the outside, someone who's working in the NBA, who's been around the sports business at the very highest level. You know, he said it is about everyone being on the same page. It has to be you know one strong figure leading, everyone getting behind that person, even if you don't agree with everything in it, you must buy into it. Is one of the issues still, and you described yourself as a game of one, or a gang of one rather, but is it still that thing that until you have every team more or less on the same page, that things will still continue to be slow and unchanging? I, I think it is, Mark. I, I definitely think it is because, as I said earlier, you've got a, a rump of core clubs who are quite established with good crowds. Then you've got almost like a conveyor belt of clubs coming and going, uh, i.e. they should never have joined the BBL because they didn't have the capital base behind them to provide the stability and balance that any successful league needs and indeed I'll probably miss names out since I've been involved I've seen Liverpool come and go Birmingham come and go Durham go Leeds go uh, London City Royals go Chess, Chester Jets am I right? Yes. go uh, Guildford something split into two and I, uh, that, that's just off the top of the head so you know that, that's like one a year average. You know, it's not. It doesn't help. So it's basically because many of the clubs are undercapitalized, and the league itself is undercapitalized. And undercapitalized is just a fancy name for not having enough money. So until money is introduced to the game and management, they both come hand in hand. There's not. It's not enough to have money. The money has got to be managed professionally by experienced managers. Until you have those ingredients in place, this Gordian knot will not be cut. Uh, but I do think that the, the, the COVID situation has sort of, uh, freed up uh, the whole landscape for professional sport right across the board, not just basketball as well as businesses. It's, re it's a real serious game changer. And... Uh, You've got to make sure you have uh, the right uh, management money uh, balance sheet in place if you want to be around when we all come out of it. But to answer your question, I, I, I think uh, the BBL and the clubs in it is pretty lopsided and lacks stability. And I've just given you an example that I think justifies the statement I've just made. If you were on that board now, I mean, given that we're in crisis management mode and in so many industries and basketball being, being just one of many, what what's the short term play, and what's the long term play in this difficult situation? Well, the short term play is survival. Uh, you want to be around, but then again, if you want to be around, you still need what I said there: money and management, just to stay in the game. If you don't have any money, I, I think you're in serious risk of uh, 
suffering an insolvency event, and, and in the BBL's case, you know, we suffer an insolvency event in terms of the license with the BBF is that, you know, the license is surrendered. So I, I think it's a very delicate uh, moment in time for the BBL. I don't think I'm the only person saying that. I might be the only person that's saying it publicly, but I don't think I'm the only person that's saying that and knows that. Uh, so I think it's very challenging times for professional basketball. It may well be very challenging times for uh, for some or all of the teams, uh, clubs uh, in, in the league, but uh, no, it's difficult. Everybody knows that. If, if the BBL survives this, and we all hope it does, and clubs can get back at some point onto the court, do you think that fundamentally this is the time and possibly a most essential time but possibly the time where clubs will feel compelled to go to stand back from this listen to the advice and the various pronouncements from from you from pundits like me from former players like Alton Bird to say hold on we really need to redefine this reshape it redraw it and and alter maybe 180 degrees from what has been done before yeah I mean everybody that is interested in basketball you, you know will have to uh, well, well I'm sure they'll say they'll share similar views to what I'm saying but the difference being you know not too many see it publicly but I, I think it needs investment and I think everybody has to go out and, uh, and look for investment the structure of the I think there will be internal pressures as well because the ownership structure is evolving all the time we have well I think like to think you know we have a, a very strong board in Glasgow Rocks uh, all the guys that are uh, directors of the club you know are, are wealthy in their own right and have access to money I think we are pretty safe in terms of survival, uh, we're a wee bit more worried about you know whether there's a league to play in. But I'm just going through the, the leagues, that, uh, the teams that I can remember. I, I think uh, you know Paul Blake in, in Newcastle runs a, a superbly professional organisation. Uh, you know Leicester's a, seems to be a pretty well-run s- situation as well. But a lot of the clubs. You know, just don't have the, the the capital base, and it's difficult. The challenge here for the league and the teams in the league is to find money. Now, I, I spend a lot of time in the states. As I said, I, I just managed to get home for a near lockdown. I've spoken to uh, several private equity companies in the states. Uh, I've given them the the speech about uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to you know grow a sport from grassroots level. But the problem, and if, once that's accepted, the problem is it's so small. They're saying, "Hey, Dave, you know, even if uh, the investment goes up tenfold in value, it's still tiny." You know, so it's just it's so small, and I think that's the the impediment to attracting uh, investors of the the type of CVC and, and BlackRock. Uh, I don't really think you know private equity companies of that. Uh, size even though they've invested in much larger sports would be interested in the BBL or pro pro men's basketball in the UK I think it's just too small for too many Uh, but it is an opportunity with a relatively modest investment I mean I've considered investing it but again I've not not got the time I'd need a partner Uh, I I would certainly invest in the right proposition but I I, I would need some partners The, the 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 time is right, you know. If you believe in that the, the basketball uh, has tremendous upside potential, now, now is the time to do it because you, you won't have this opportunity again. Uh, so I, I, I'm always optimistic, but uh, uh, it's difficult. <laughs> what What is your? I mean, since we talked about this, this season's not officially cancelled yet. Let's be honest about it. It's cancelled. It's done. No one sees this coming back, even if it may be the autumn, but the season as we knew it it, is over on this. Do you think that there will be pressure next year to, or or should there be pressure even, to reduce budgets for a year, to retrench even? Or would that be the mistake of all mistakes to to kind of run things down for a year to somehow recover from the losses or the, the trouble that everyone has made? 
Well, if well, all depends on whether and when the lockdown is over and their respective governments, because there are two here, although we are in a British league, essentially it's a, it's a league authorised by uh, the BBF in England, and it's an English registered company, Scots, Glasgow Rocks, being the only Scottish re- representative. And we have two governments, so, but if we ignore the fact that we're in Scotland, it's a government decision that will decide whether crowds can go and watch sports games, basketball included, and we don't know when that will happen. Uh, this R number that everybody's familiar with, we don't know what, what will happen and when uh, people will be allowed to congregate indoors watching basketball. So that the longer that that is not possible, the more uh, the more uh, difficult the situation becomes for not only the league but the teams in the league. So what it means is certainly you can free all your players. I mean, I don't know what the situation is with the teams, whether even if the league opened, which it reopened, which it won't, you could suddenly commandeer a bunch of players to finish it. Certainly, as far as I'm aware, all Glasgow Rocks players are all out of contract, but the foreign ones are way home. Um, but what calibre of player can you afford to put on the court when you have zero revenue coming into your club because this is an attendance based sport first and foremost and it's attendance based sports that are suffering the most. The ones that are over reliant on match or game day income and discretionary income for uh, hot dogs and beers they're the ones that are most financially precarious. So I, I, I don't know what type of player a basketball team could uh, in the BBL could afford to put on the court uh, in a in the current environment that we have. I think budgets are bound to fall uh, down. I, I can't see any other way. Another reason why clubs and the and the, the BBL are, are are so precarious at the moment is they are certainly in the BBL's case uh, totally reliant on game day income. There is no television broadcast contract. And frankly, that is an indictment on the board. That's a failure. None of the competitions are sponsored, have a major sponsor. That's an indictment on the board. It's really uh, a quite an appalling situation and one that they're paying the price for because the BBL has no money coming in. Is that not also, to some respects, a factor of clubs that and who if you find a big sponsor say the Budweiser Corporation came back in for this league once again that clubs are not in this position or don't have the capacity to deliver value for sponsors because it's okay having a nice title sponsor and a shiny sponsor sponsors want activation at local levels and a lot of those clubs just simply couldn't deliver on a big plan well, that is true, and that's back to your sort of lopsided league. Glasgow Rocks, eh, when I was involved, uh, are, are now sponsored by Coors, Carling Coors, and you know we use a stadium which is owned and operated by Glasgow City Council, and uh, and their their Quango that operates the discretionary spend franchise, and they didn't stock uh, Carling Coors. But we persuaded them to, and basically that worked out for us. So we have got uh, Carling Coors. I think it's Coors actually, is it? I think it's Coors on the on, on the jerseys, and that was done when I was when I was involved. So if, if Budweiser or Carling Coors, for that matter, are going to get involved with the league, what you're basically saying is how how could they deliver? How could the BBL deliver? product in, in an acceptable manner uh, to, to the sponsor. Well, some clubs could. I mean, Leicester and, uh, and certainly uh, Newcastle operate their own arenas, I, I, and I think they could have product in there. Plymouth, or, or uh, not Plymouth, uh, Bristol, uh, are building or have built, I'm, I'm not sure what the up-to-date situation is with their arena. So, so some could, half the league could, could, but the other half you know, could still play out of gym halls, if you like. So it goes back to the lopsided nature uh, of the league 
uh, and uh, you know that that is an ongoing problem. A, a good league and a good sponsor would have clubs that have their own arenas uh, and their own rights to sell, and we're not in that situation yet. So it's, you, there's a point. You know, I'm a sort of agreeing with the inference in your question uh, that that's a disincentive to the the Budweisers of the world to invest in the in a pro league as it stands just now. Uh, another of, negative. Sorry. Uh, a couple of. I'm not sure if that was an ambulance near you or I, but there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, a couple of rocks related questions just to finish off. Um, sure. You guys have talked about an arena, like everyone else. Where are you at down that path at the moment? Well, again, we were make, making rapid progress before the onslaught of the the coronavirus. I mean, we were in the East End opposite Celtic Park. It's emerging as a sports village uh, of a fashion. And we've had some very productive uh, talks indeed uh, with various different stakeholders in the area. Uh, we have the option of some land. We have some financial contribution. I don't know whether it's have or had, given the, 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 the virus. But we, we were basically on on, on paper or verbally uh, rather uh, two thirds funded uh, and we're confident that uh, we, we could fill that funding gap but I think that's all on, on, on the back burner now uh, uh, until you know we know we have a clearer picture or a clearer view forward uh, post virus but I'm not in the loop maybe Duncan's made some progress since then I, I, I don't know last thing I've talked about Duncan um Duncan Smiley, that your your fellow or fellow owner or shareholder in the Rocks, he had this famous statement that he was going to go out and fight in the trenches for the Rocks to be awarded the league title. There was a little bit of push pushback on from other clubs. Some of it quite amusing on Twitter. Let's be said. Do you guys still, as a group, think you should be the league champions? Defo. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's uh, and Celtic should be the, the league champions as well. Um, Look. I can't. What's the percentage? You tell me, Mark. Is it eighty percent over? Is the game is more? The league's more or less over. It's not a null and void situation, and therefore it's an award. The and the league's not going to finish. There's not going to be any playoffs. There just isn't. Uh, the league's over. And the Glasgow Rocks are top of the league, and Glasgow Rocks are the champions, and we'll be having our own little celebration. You know when it's formally announced. That the league is over because there's not going to be any more games. End of, and it's not going to be null and voided. End of. So therefore, who's top? Glasgow's top. So who are, who are the champions? Glasgow. So I don't really care what anybody else thinks. I'll be celebrating uh, when it's announced there's going to be no more games played. And the open top bus, I'm sure, is already booked, right? Yeah, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> David, um, it's been very interesting listening to about the business of basketball and uh, the thoughts on where this might go. Um, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you, I'm sure, when a new season eventually comes. Thank you, and stay safe as well. Thanks, David. That's it for this edition of the MVP Cast, brought to you in association with Total Environmental Compliance please check them out at tecompliance.co.uk. All our previous editions are available at mvp247.com or via your preferred podcast provider. Please do leave us a review, preferably a nice one. Another MVP cast coming very soon. But for me, Mark Woods, stay safe and alert. It's bye for now. Bye.